Well, while we're getting settled, I'm John Toole. I'm the executive director and CEO of the Computer History Museum. And I think they're going to cut off, cut over my set of slides back there. Hello? <laughs> this will happen. Can, can I have my, my slide switch, please? <laughs> Pretty please. <laughs> While we're waiting for a little technical difficulty, um, let me introduce a couple of people um, from my organization. Um, that you probably know, some of you may not know. Karen Matthews, uh, my executive vice president uh, of, the, of, the, of the Computer History Museum. David Miller, out and back, vice president of development. And we also have Mike, are you here? Mike Williams? Mike Williams. Mike Williams is our new head curator um, who just came from the University of Calgary. I'm very proud to announce to have him on board. And we're going to give you a little sneak preview of a press conference we're having tomorrow. I'm going to talk a little bit, just very briefly, uh, about a little run through, give you a little background about the museum. I'm going to ask uh, Dave House, our vice chairman of the Board of Trustees, to talk just a moment about what the museum is all about from his perspective. And then I'm going to come back and introduce our wonderful speaker for the evening, Eric Schmidt. As most of you, I hope, know by now, we had roots over 20 years ago in the Boston Computer Museum, founded by Gordon and Gwen Bell. Uh, we're an independent organization. Uh, our older logo, we just have put on a new logo, and I'm wearing that on a shirt, by the way, that my wife says is, is available for sale out in the back. But the reality is the logo represents a very important thing to us. It's a new image. It's, it's a new entity and identity that we're putting together. And really what that means is that it represents the artifacts, the preservation. It represents the people and communities that are so important to make computer history alive and real. And it also means the things that we're going to do for the digital artifacts, the zeros and ones that you see. And we've had a rich history and a very strong board and a strong organization. And there's a lot of real things that I'm going to show you tonight. Our collection extends to artifacts, films and videos, photographs, documentation, and software. Unfortunately, our space limitations today uh, don't prevent us really from doing the things we want to do and we need to do to preserve everything. But I'll tell you a little bit about that in a moment. We really have a world-class collection. Uh, we just recently took a whole trip around the world and in Europe, uh, visited London, Munich, and Paderborn, Germany, and have really concluded that, that our focus of what we are to preserve the artifacts and stories in the information age on an international scale is really a very unique opportunity uh, and really isn't being done. And we're losing things all the time, which makes it really important for all of us. We have a visible storage exhibit area on Moffett Field today. Uh, it really consists of, uh, of a lot of very interesting pieces of, of computing artifacts that you probably will never see anywhere else in the world side by side. I can't share with you the smell and feel of those artifacts, but I, but I certainly want to invite each and every one of you to come join us. Uh, this is a view of, as we pan through the cray, uh, what we have a piece of ENIAC that was on loan, or a piece of SAGE, uh, which was a semi-automatic ground environment system. Uh, the kitchen computer, a lot of very interesting artifacts with a lot of interesting stories that our docents and Mike Williams and his team uh, can tell you all the technical details, the social details, and the wonderful stories that go along with it. Again, we don't have all of the things that we want or the space, and that's part of what we are in the process of doing, uh, both with the people and the energy associated with it. Some pictures of volunteers. Uh, we hope each and every one of you will either be a volunteer, a donor, uh, or become very much engaged with us now and in the future. And there's all kinds of very interesting things. But the exciting part is really where the NASA Research Park, uh, which is our plan of record of where we're going to be located. Uh, the big hangar, of course, is going to be converted into an air and space center as part of this process. And you'll probably hear in the area uh, a number of public hearings. I encourage each of you to, to attend those if you'd like and, and voice your opinion, pro or against, or your concerns. It's all talking about what this is going to be, and I think it's a wonderful opportunity. Uh, we've got three acres of land right in front that we're going to build a 120,000 square foot building in a couple of phases. 
Um, there's a whole section back here. There's going to be a Carl Sagan Center for Astrobiology and a university park complex, U University of Santa Cruz, San Jose State, and Carnegie Mellon University. So it's a very exciting opportunity. Uh, our future site, as you look kind of toward the hangar, uh, is, is really a very interesting way in which we can build a very exciting kind of a building. This happens to be one of about nine different versions with, that we went through in a, an ideas competition that we selected EHDD. We haven't selected this particular building, by the way. We are only in the uh, schematic, early parts of the schematic design program and pro process phases. But basically, we've picked, chosen these people as EHDD and Ben Sickle and Rolleri, who built an uh, experienced music project in uh, Seattle as our, our exhibit designers, as a real architecture and exhibit design team that's working closely with our board, closely with our staff, to really build a world-class institution for the long term. Expecting to open in 2003, uh, excuse me, op Great Brown in 2003, and open in 2005. Um, this is sort of a synopsis of the people that I just stated. Um, we're an international museum, and you know, someone would thought the building might look really nice if we put a um, telephone booth there. This is actually one of our artifacts that was just recently donated from Switzerland, and and it may look a little fun, kind of an organ, uh, artifact, but inside of it is really the world's first teleguide that was used as a directory assistance for, for in, in the public uh, domain. So there's little interesting stories that you're going to find all the way through this. We really can't succeed on our own, uh, even with the space that we have, uh, waiting for 2005, spread over four buildings. Uh, we are in the process of putting up an interim building. We're going to call this the Beta Building, and we're going to announce this tomorrow. It's about 40,000 square feet to consist of warehouse space, about 10,000 square feet of administrative office space to consolidate our people and to build the culture we need to, to service the community that we think is important. And the rest of the space would be some exhibit space and, and assembly space. So this will give, and this will be completed late summer, early fall of next year. So we have a program, we have a process, and we're really running fast and hard to really preserve those artifacts and stories. We've had a tremendous lecture series. As many of you know, many familiar faces. I welcome you uh, this evening. Uh, you'll he you we'll introduce Eric in a, in a moment. And we've got some wonderful upcoming 2002 lectures that we're putting together that will be announced. This is sort of a sneak preview of just a few of those people that, that we've already got set up and many more yet to come. I really want to challenge you all and, and ask you all to come, come join us. Uh, spread the word. Um, take a look at we're spreading really our logo around. It's our new logo, our new identity. Volunteers are particularly important, both from the point of view of helping us and the donations that they actually can bring to us in time, energy, enthusiasm, the building, the community that's so important to make this a piece and part of every one of you. And become a supporter. And uh, toward that end, we've, we've given you our new brochure uh, that each of you have that just has a little snippet of some of the things that talks about the timeline. And, and I hope you will enjoy it. Some of this is in the mail to, to some of you, that some of our supporters. And I'd now like to ask uh, Dave House, our Vice Chairman of the Board of Trustees and CEO of Allegro Networks, uh, to come and tell us your perspective of the museum. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, John. Uh, you're all part of a very important industry. <clears throat> you're here tonight because you are part of that industry and you've got an interest in that industry. It's an industry that's changed all mankind. There's, there's two periods of time that history will record. There's the time before we had computers, and there's the time after we had computers. And we, many of us, have been alive in both of those periods and part of creating that change uh, that's happened in not just industry but in civilization today. Today, the information technology industry, the information industry, computers and networking are the largest industry in the world today. It's bigger than automotive. It's bigger than petrochemicals. It's bigger than any other industry. It generates more engineers and employs more engineers than any other industry in the world. Its uh, economic importance uh, is enormous, yet it is an uh, industry that is very, very brand new that's happened in the last 60 years. Our charter is to preserve the artifacts and the stories about that industry for posterity. And we're a volunteer organization, 
We're a budding organization, an organization with an excellent staff, John leading it. He's introduced a few of the people on the staff, a growing staff of individuals, and a growing set of facilities using some uh, buildings that we currently, four different buildings we're operating in uh, on the uh, Moffitt campus, starting construction very soon on our first purpose-built building, that is one that we are building ourselves, which will eventually become warehouse storage, but will be a combination of office storage assembly for meetings and lectures like this, etc. Now, this organization is not a government organization. We, there's no government money going into this. We don't get money from the federal or the state or any agencies. You got a, a, bro, a, a brochure that's on your uh, was on your chair. Tells you about the computer history museum, and in the back is some important, is particularly important information. One is there's a list with really uh, small mice type. These are the people who have made this possible. These are the donors that have contributed to our campaign last year. We had very little in money from industry. It's almost entirely uh, from individuals. And also in here is a pledge form and an envelope in which you can mail that form. What I'd like you to do is take a look at that and see if you can be part of helping this organization. It's December. It's the end of the year. It's time to make your annual donations. It's time to get them in on your uh, taxes for 2001. So what I'd like you to do before the end of this year and maybe before the end of this evening, take a look here and see if you're able to contribute. We appreciate contributions at any level. Uh, you notice we're a little bit nerdy, and so those of us on the hardware side realize that 1K is 1024, so we make our lowest uh, core donation be 1024. Uh, you know, 4096, 16384, which is actual 16K, et cetera. So we'd like you to uh, take a look at your own situation uh, and uh, reach into your contributions and make your donation towards preserving the artifacts and the stories of the information age, the industry that clearly is very important to you or you wouldn't be here tonight. So take this seriously. We only get money from people like pe you, people in this room. It's completely a organization financed uh, from individual donations. So please do what you can for us. Thank you. Thank you, Dave, and thank you all. We want to change gears, of course, now, because get into what we're really here for tonight, most of you came. I think in general, you know, we have a CEO's CEO this evening, Eric Schmidt, um, going to talk to us and has really done a lot of work. It's a very special evening as a result because leadership, it's economics, innovation, and how it all fits together and the experiences are something that's very, very important to try to understand, to learn about, and to apply for now and in the future. And so, Eric, we're very happy to have you this evening. Uh, for a number of things. Chairman and CEO of Google, certainly my home page that I personally use for my, my browser, I'll have to admit. Uh, certainly the former CEO, Chairman of, of Novell, and a 20-year history of executive experience that we're really looking forward to. Eric Schmidt. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Um, it's a great honor for me to be here, and I mean that because I was in this audience when this building was opened, and uh, and I remember sitting right there, uh, and I want to encourage you to participate. I think that what the museum is trying to do is very, very important, and I think what I want to address for the purposes of tonight is what can we learn and what mistakes are we making now? Uh, and I think ultimately the study of history is really about what can we now do based on what we now understand. So I, I started sort of thinking, well, how many natural laws are there? There's sort of the law, you all heard these, right? There's the, the, the law of unintended consequences, right? That's what governments do. There's Moore's law, we know that. Metcalfe's law, the value of the network increases n squared in the number of n of devices on it. There's Joy's law, MIPS equals two to the year minus 1984. In the original, remember that? The definition of MIPS is actually true even today, amazingly. 
There's the law of evolution. There's a the law of protocols. Every successful protocol gives you a hundred, sorry, one billion dollars in market value, right? You heard that one. Uh, it was true until the crash. Um, there's Gates's law: you can never be too rich. There's there's the socialite's law: you can never be too rich and too thin. Um, there's uh, Al Haig's law: I'm in charge here. Um, I'm dating my. It's a history talk, you know. You have to. They're fun ones, right? There's Gresham law, Gresham's law, you all know that law. That's the law why chat rooms are not places where normal people inhabit anymore, right? You know what Gresham's law is. There's the law that CEOs' jobs are getting shorter and shorter, right? <laughs> Some of my board members are here, so don't listen to that one. There's the law that the internet always wins, which I actually think is true. And then there's a new law, which I'm going to propose for the purposes of tonight, which is that a lot of laws are really opportunities that have since passed, right? And that the trick in our industry is to, to do something really new and innovate all this and put this stuff together. And, and I believe profoundly that there's a set of real rules that govern what we do. And I think that in our, in our job of understanding what's happened and, and planning the future, there are a number that really matter. I mean, processor speed, uh, network speed, disk capacity, all of those things, internet traffic are all doubling roughly every 12 to 18 months. And that's true whether we're making money at it or not. Uh, network effects are the next vendor lock-ins, and we're going to talk about that. There is always some proprietary advantage in an open source strategy. You just have to figure it out. But I think the real, the really true laws are really two. I think the first is that each and every generation makes the same mistakes, right? Right. The older folks in the audience are saying yes. And we're going to hammer this one, let me tell you. <laughs> and then there's, of course, what I think George Gilder's real law is, which is that the only real scarcity is your own life. Right, and that's what we really are here, here to talk about. Now, now, what I did is I, um, I, I brought lots of artifacts, but I scanned them, you know, and we're sort of with it. So this is the, the license plate that we, all, that we all had in roughly 1977, 1978. Uh, and, and this is the way Unix felt. And for those of you who are in the Linux community, it's the same feeling, and we would, and by the way, we would like to be as young as you are now. You know, it's the same. It's the same thing. We're only 20 years older, right? I can see my friends in the audience who were with me at the time. It's the same thing, right? Uh, and, and you know, the early Unix history was it was as as you know, and we'll just go through this quickly. It was developed at Bell. The first the first port was done to something called the Interdata, and the Interdata, the first port outside of Bell Labs, was done to an IBM machine by a set of students at Princeton University in 1975. Bell Labs had this interesting thing that they stumbled into about licensing because they were not profit. If you were a university, you could use Unix, and if you, were, if you were not a university, you had to talk to this group, which ultimately became Unix Systems Labs. Um, and of course, Unix at the time was time sharing, and word processing consisted of NROF and TROF, right? And I remember those commands. And of course, at the same time, and I want to bring you to sort of my first discussion point, uh, the internet was, uh, routing was invented through Paul Barron and his work in 64. Uh, Vint and Bob invented the concept of TCP IP in roughly 1974. Um, a number of, of sites were done, which involved imps and, and specialized hardware. There was a computer here in this, uh, here in the building next door, which was one of the first first things connected to the internet called Max. Um, BSD at the same time, when we when I was part of this, had uh, this is the Berkeley Software Distribution, had a licensing model which was an evolution of all of this, where all of a sudden, if you're a university and you call us up and you send us fifty dollars, we would send you a tape. So our strategy, our licensing strategy was we would send you a tape with a source. And it was a, a, a VAX mag tape. And of course, we'd ported it to the 780. And, and the, BSD, the BSD series, there was you know, BSD 1 and 2 and 3 and 4 and 4.1 and 4.1c and 4.2 and 4.3 and 4.4. And then it sort of ended in roughly 1993. And the heyday was in this early period, 1977 to 1970, 1979. And what happened was because we were shipping these tapes out, People were getting all this source, and they were using it to build internets. And they would, they would run these VAXs in the later suns, and they would use it using TCP IP. And the first really production implementation of TCP IP was done on BSD Unix. So we, we were really full of ourselves. We thought this would be just really neat. We would change the world as a result, right? Of course, we had the wrong hardware and the wrong operating system, and, and we didn't exactly understand Monopoly and all that. We'll come to that. Now, <laughs> AT&T at the same time had a group that it formed called System 5. And System 5 was to productize all of this. And the problem was that the people who did Unix didn't want to go work in this group. And so one of the first things to know is you've got to get your people, your policies, and your customers in alignment. 
And if you don't, you pay for it. We paid for it for maybe 15 years. Uh, Sun at the same time was founded in 1982. And it's interesting that there was another variant, and a number of people in the room participated in this, where, where St Sun, which stands for Stanford University Network, um, was a, essentially a hardware board that was licensed by Stanford, they were very liberal, to six companies. Anyone can name the other five besides Sun? No, because Andy Bettelsheim, who designed the boards and is the only guy who could debug them, went to Sun. So again, what do we learn here? We learn that the technology has to work and you have to have the people doing it. Another sort of key early insight. A and at the same time, Xerox, again, literally in the building attached to this one, is busy building, inventing the Alto, the laser printer, and all these incredible things that changed our world. Uh, these PCs were not networked. The first PC that I, that I ever saw was in the building next door again when I, when I worked here. And it cost $3,000. It came with 64 kilobytes of RAM, a floppy, and a monochrome display. We, of course, thought it was useless. And we were right, right? Because we were busy running on Altos and Unix machines. And in fact, what happened was I gave a talk, right? And this is the, the first slide of my talk about Unix at the time. I did this in 1982. This, was, this diagram was done with SIL, which is a, <laughs> which is a predecessor. You, rec you remember it. Um, uh, and, and this was the talk that I gave about the evolution of Unix. And you can see that even then Unix was getting itself into trouble, right? And this is before all the commercialization, et cetera. So the reason I take you through this is I think sets up the first really interesting open source scenario. Microsoft had delivered DOS. System 5 had just begun to formed. Sun was shipping workstations based on BSD. The ARPANET was beginning to use SunOS and BSD variants. Apollo was shipping this workstation, and the first really, cho really interesting choice happened. And Bill Joy was, of course, the founder of Sun, and he occupied at the time the position. He's a close friend, so I obviously have a bias. He occupied a position very similar to what uh, Linus Torvalds has today in the industry. It really was very iconic. And I remember in 1983 going to a conference with him where all of these people wanted his autograph and wanted to talk to him. And I had my first, ge first glimpse of geek fame. And this was very heady. And my job was to make sure the adoring crowds would, would, would not assault him so he could continue to write code. Uh, and of course, we've since, we've since multiplied that many, many times. But it works. And it works because the stuff really matters. Uh, the first real attempt we did with licensing was something called uh, Network File System NFS. And it succeeded. And, and let me tell you, let me tell you the, the early licensees in 1984. Let me just read them to you. Alliant, Pyramid, Gould, Mount Zainu, Lockman, CSEE, whoever they are, Eakins, GCA, Tropel, Sequence, Celerity, Data Generals, Cadnetics, the instruction set, Unisoft, Spartacus, DEC, Siemens, Convex, SGI, ISI, Cronin, Wollongong, MIPS, Bull, CCI, Alexi, Whitechapel, Encore, AT&T, Toshiba, and Zilog, and Nixdorf. How many of those companies, like, I don't even remember what they did, let alone are they not around? But what happened was that, that uh, we put together a program where we had the source code, we gave it up, we followed the BSD model. And the particular technology called NFS was stateless. And what happened was that you could implement it in such a way that it had very easy failover. And all the other technologies that people were using were very sophisticated distributed computing platforms that probably worked under some assumptions but were impossible to implement. So the first thing we learned in this was that if you built something really simple and it worked and it scaled and it was portable, and we could talk in the Q&A about, about some of the technical details for that, you could pull it off. It was very simple. It was easy to add. It was compatible. You didn't even change your APIs. Uh, it slid under existing file system. It wasn't a distributed operating system. And the strategy that we adopted was novel at the time, and, uh, as, and as a result, we're building so something so useful and making it free to, to people and giving it to your competitors was hugely controversial. Now, those of you who spent years in what happened subsequently don't remember what a new idea this was at the time. It wasn't mine. I was simply implementing it. But, but the fact of the matter is that it really was a new strategy, and, and it worked brilliantly. And all of a sudden, we had something to talk about. Because who wants to talk about the products you build? You want to talk about the strategy. The press have to get excited, all three of them, you know, at the time. I mean, who cares about Unix at the time, right? We're busy doing our thing. We're, you know, there's client server computing. They're all having a good time, and so forth and so on. Um, the competitors of Apollo Domain, in particular, did not have such a strategy, and they had more complicated technology. And by the way, their product was better. On almost any comparison, it was better. But we won. And we won because we, we followed simplicity. 
Now, by the way, this is 1984. The exact same recipe worked each, in each of every five-year increment since. So why don't we just keep doing that? Right? Why is it that the industry always does the other maneuver? And I still don't know that, but I think it's one of the questions for all of us. Uh, and what's interesting as a result is it, be, it made a name for Sun in a very early period as an innovator in technology and business practices, and Sun became emboldened with respect to its strategy. This is also known as arrogance. So, <laughs> although I was trying to be polite in my notes. So it seems to me that, you, that the first lesson that you learn from this is that there's an inevitability principle, that what you want to do is the day you start, you want to create the inevitable success of your product through a series of strategic decisions, licensing, and adoption. And at the time, so it was a very small company. Uh, the Unix industry was, was sort of, nobody even understood it, let alone have the kind of press coverage that we had subsequently. And so it worked. And it also, another law I would suggest is it pays to be first with a new model. And of course, this is, uh, this is another picture of Bill. I'm going to have a bunch of magazine pictures, Fortune, Upside, and so forth, to try to illustrate this. And Bill is, I think, properly credited now with having written the code that became the initial definition of how the internet actually worked. At the same time, and I'll give you some asides, this is the first um, mention that I can find in my stack of history around Microsoft. And look at the title. Now, would you be surprised if I told you that this was dated 1984? <laughs> 1984. By the way, they were running DOS, right? Which wasn't any better then than it is now. OK? <laughs> And, 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 and Bill is 28 years old. And if you read this, it's like it's a game plan for the next 17 years. So what do you learn? They're executing the same plan they've had since then. And we should have read the article at the time. I filed it away. <laughs> OK, seriously. So anyway, as a result, we decided that we were an open company. It was open systems. And that was, all, that was always the right answer. And so what we did is Sun, for various reasons, had this technology called SunView. And SunView was a. Um, uh, not a network-based model, but a kernel-based graphics model. It was relatively straightforward. It worked extremely well. People liked it. It only ran on suns. We had the problem of what to do. So here we had all these people building on top of it. Um, Apollo had something called DSCE, which was a similar technology at the time. So we said, ah, perfect. We are brilliant. What we're going to do is take this NFS model, we're going to completely clone it, and we're going to do it with this technology called NEWS, Network Extensible Windows System. Everybody goes, yeah. Um, and the problem with news was, well, there's like, I have a whole page. Well, the first problem is, it didn't work. I, hate, I, I wanted to say that for 15 years. I couldn't say it before. <laughs> uh, and, and by the way, it was a great product in a different year. The performance, uh, the, the performance wasn't there. The scalability wasn't there. Uh, it was a brilliant idea. It tried to combine three different things, server-based window systems, a PostScript imaging model and program, program, programmability and extensibility. Any one of those is a major challenge. And you'll see later that X, who won, only did one of those. We had all sorts of problems. We decided to clone Adobe because we didn't like their business terms. So we had now the cloning problem. I'll come back to that. Uh, we didn't give, we didn't give our, our customers very much help. The technical advantages, people would look at this and go, like, well, this is like, I'm not quite sure what it does, but it's quite interesting. And then they would go back to whatever they were doing before. And then, and by the way, that was not the thing that killed it. Because as we know, non-working software can be fixed um, over time. Well, you can work on it, right? <laughs> the real problem was the strategy didn't work because now we had a bunch of competitors who didn't want to give us a second win. So you get one shot. And we got our shot. And we executed it very well, by the way. The second shot, we're not going to get. And in fact, what was very interesting is the competitor, which is called X, was a technology developed at MIT. And X was actually quite a good technology, which was funded by DEC, but through MIT. Now, this is, this is the NFS strategy being done to us. And of course, we were too dull to figure this out at the time. So we, breast, you know, we beat our breasts a lot and talked about it and so forth and so on. And, and meanwhile, everyone's talking about the Macintosh, which at the time you know, was very strong and, and very exciting. And we tried to get a deal done with with Apple in this regard, but we couldn't pull it off for various complicated reasons. So you had venomous com competition from HP, DEC, and IBM who were absolutely convinced that they would do whatever it did to stop us. Plus, you had the problem that the technology did not, in fact, solve the problem that everyone had. Well, this is not a recipe for success. Uh, and furthermore, we ended up in this weird problem of mechanism versus policy. 
because everybody started talking about what we'll do is we'll produce mechanisms for things, but we won't produce policies for this. This, by the way, was a very bad idea, and I was one of its biggest proponents. Uh, and the reason is that the person using the computer wants a policy. They could give a crap about your mechanism, right? For those of you in engineering, the mechanism is very interesting. It's nice to give talks. People want something that works, right? So we gave general mechanisms both in X and in news, but in fact, people didn't really want to do it. So, so, so what does Sun do? Well, again, another one of our brilliant ideas. We decided to merge X and news, right? Right. Those of you who used it have the correct reaction. <laughs> now, this took this took two years because the architecture, although although the the slideware was very good, right? They were slideware compatible, <laughs> right? Right. That's how we do marketing. When you actually merge them together, you get you get something that doesn't work. Now, meanwhile, the team that built this played an April Fool's joke on me and and uh, sold me a car without my permission and then put it into my office. And, and the joke we had at the time was this was the only project that they had de ever delivered on time. <laughs> uh, so here's me in my car inside my office, and it's really hard to get rid of a Volkswagen from your office. Here's a, we, we had a lot of buttons at, at, in this period. This is another one, um, and I, I reproduced some of them for your enjoyment. Um, and make sure you save the buttons so when you get a chance to give a talk like this, you can embarrass all the people who came up with these ideas. The best part about news was we got to do our first deal with Microsoft. Um, as is typical with Microsoft, they have unintended consequences. This one has the interesting unintended consequence that it has a quote from Scott. Quote, Sun Microsystems and Microsoft are leaders in the development of an open systems approach to graphics in their respective markets. Uh, he denies the quote. Um, and um, one of the things to know is that Microsoft signed the contract, took the code, inspected it, learned everything they could from it, and never used it again. Interesting. Uh, um, now, so what do you learn from this? Somebody else can play the game. Let's keep going, right? So, that, so we, we don't get enough, right? We've got to do it again. So now we've got the problem where you've got the System 5, release, System 5 folks and you've got the BSD folks. And everyone will be served better by, one, by Unix unification. Um, and we had done a deal about converging the two where what we agreed to do is to take the interface definitions from System 5 and add them to BSD. Uh, this is a deal that I did, and we were going to, uh, uh, Sun would continue to work on Net Berkeley protocols, ARPANET, NDS, Yellow Pages, Rex, Locking, and PCNFS. And we planned to add things like pipes and some of the other things people actually wanted. This strategy worked brilliantly because no one actually used the libraries. So, so the great thing about some of these deals is if no one actually needs the deal, and what you need is you need the marketing effect, then you're fine. But if you actually try to do the merge, right, it takes years out of your life. So, so we, we then pushing on our open system strategy, which of course we called you know open systems for open minds, and our joke was open systems for open wallets, um, was to establish sort of a new religion that there would be these interoperable interfaces that everyone would base on, and then these things would scale and so forth and so on. Um, and we were consumed by this. And at the same time, one of the uh, early inventors here at Xerox went to Microsoft and developed Windows 1.0 delivered in 1985, it wasn't very successful because the hardware platform was so weak, but it set in motion the other path. And I'm gonna keep bringing you back to these two paths because I think that they're illustrative as to what really happened. So anyway, as a result, through a long series of things in 1987, we announced the big deal with AT&T. And the big deal with AT&T was to create the Unix standard. We announced this as a series of phases. The first phase was this interoperability phase, the second phase was a true merger, and the third one was a, a, third one was a research project. The research project never happened, and the first interface did, and the second merger did indeed occur, and that's what's now called System 5 Release 4. Um, I don't know what was going through our mind, but it never occurred to us that our competitors, having been warmed up by the success in news, would see this as annihilation. And in fact, the, the, if you go back to the speeches and the positioning that we took at the time, maybe we were baiting them. Uh, maybe it was one of those unconscious things you do as humans that you really shouldn't be doing. I don't understand why we did that, and I played my role in it. But the important thing is that when we announced in October of 1987 that we were going to unify Unix, and it was going to be AT&T and Sun along with, with Motorola, and we were going to establish a binary interface standard for both hardware and software, the world blew up, right? And it blew up big time. Um, so the idea here was we would partner with AT&T, we would work with these groups, and we would... We, we would we, we would literally have a combined problem. The problem was that this was a, a change in our strategy because up until then, 
all of the Unix technology that I'd worked on had been shared through this variant of open source licensing. Uh, the way it used to work with the BSD world is that you know, you'd have somebody like Van Jacobsen, who's a brilliant Berkeley, Berkeley person, who would just add TCP IP code, and we would just sort of add it in. But because of the merger and because of the commercialization, that wouldn't happen anymore. So eventually, AT&T and, and Sun formed a group called Unix International, and I'll come back to this in a bit. And of course, they were initially called the Archer Group. OSF then formed, and of course, you know what OSF stands for, Oppose Sun Forever, um, Open Software Open Systems, Open Software Foundation. Uh, formed in 1988, in January 1988, in, in, in 100 Hamilton Avenue, which coincidentally, six years later, was the site of all the Java work. Uh, so it shows you what, what goes around comes around. Now, what's interesting about this, and I don't want to dwell on it on the product side, is that it eventually won. And it won because of the sheer weight, power, money, you know, hot air, you name it. It took a lot, and it eventually won. It was many years late. And uh, some of the implications of this were quite interesting. A lot of the key technical people who were working in, in, in my part of Unix in, in the world actually left because of it, because they didn't like what they were doing. It actually caused a, a transfer of technology people out. Because working on mergers with technology and for reasons that are good strategically but not very good technically is not a very good way to maintain your, your top technical people. And that's an important lesson that I learned the hard way, and I think we all did. The deal itself was a great source of funding for Sun. AT&T had invested $250 million to make this all happen. In hindsight, of course, we should have just taken the money and gone and taken the Mac user interface and put it on top of BSD and changed the world, but that wasn't part of the deal. Um, <laughs> So, you know, I was trying to think, how do I characterize this? And I think the, the rule is, you know, when, when elephants make love, you should run out of the forest. <laughs> uh, but I think that we're, we're beginning to see these ideas again. People started throwing these ideas around for various reasons, and they just don't work. So there was this continual refrain for the unification of Unix, 1989. Unix popularity hinges on the emergence of a single version of the operating system, which is designed to allow many users to tackle jobs on one computer system. Currently, because computers use their own version of Unix, it's difficult to make a single Unix application run on a variety of platforms, right? And that was repeated many, many thousands of times. And if you go to Google and you look it up, you'll see them all. It's quite distressing. Uh, at the same time, there was this group called XOpen that decided that it would insert, insert itself in this because they were a standardization body. They tried to, to, to define these interfaces, but of course, they were always late to the fire. Uh, Sun was busy sp uh, pushing something called an ABI for Spark, an application's binary interface. At the same time, uh, a derivative of OSF called the, uh, called the um, uh, I forgot their name, formed by Compaq, DEC, and SGI, were formed to standardize on the MIPS architecture. Sun then pushed something called Open Network Computing, which included NFS. I'll, I'll do this quickly because you'll see it gets very boring. OSF developed something called DCE, which is Distributed Computing Environment. I had to look these things up because I'd forgotten. We, but they used their own RPC mechanism, which was incompatible. Then Unix International it developed something called Open Systems Architecture, which did not include the technology from their funders, but included the other guys which no one used. Right? Now, if you're a customer, what is your reaction to this? Now, meanwhile, here we are, okay, and we got the other guys, right? And the other guys were bringing out Presentation Manager, uh, in, 1990, in 1988, and Windows 3.0 comes out in 1990 and really kicks off what we know as the modern Windows era. Um, Microsoft cleverly gave OS 2 2.0 to, to IBM and took OS 2 3.0, which they then renamed NT, which has now become the basis for what we know as Windows XP. So we get to play the game again. Um, so, <laughs> so Scott, um, so. so I don't know how to introduce this, except that it got to the point where we, we were the subject of all media coverage, right, as this, as this went on. And the media was very important because the media drove the behavior of a lot of the participants. Here's a, a particularly fun cover, cover of Scott. Uh, and in fact, there was a series of, a series of articles which said that, um, that these were turning points for the company. So what happens is everybody gets all excited and are these strategies working? Um, so as, as you can see, and of course they're, they're equivalent, and I, I don't have as many of the non-Sun covers, but there's the equivalent coverage of the other guys. So everybody's being pitted now, right, and the wars are, the wars are playing. So I couldn't figure out what this, what this, what, what this um, button was from. This is called Open Network Computing, and I couldn't tell if it was by the Open Network Computing people or against the Open Network Computing people. <laughs> and I don't remember what was in Open Network Computing, except that I can tell you it didn't work, right? So 
this went on and on and on and on. Um, so meanwhile, X Windows had managed to get itself established. And Open Look was another brilliant idea we had. And this is a, a, a joint, joint design between AT&T and Sun, again, licensed to everyone, but no one wanted it. They were busy building something called Motif. And Motif was, because X did not have a policy, just had mechanism, you needed a window manager, Motif was it. Now, the brilliant thing about Motif is that everyone managed to dis convince themselves that Motif was going to win. And so all of a sudden now, there was yet another war, right? And that war was around who would use each of these layers. And you get the idea, right? Each layer each creates a new war. And the way we solve these out is we have this sort of combat. Meanwhile, the other guys are busy making progress. Uh, my important point here is that the, the, the open look and motif problem then became the problem once we'd resolved the previous one. So we finally got to Unix unification. In 1992, we had Sun was running SVR4 and open look, HP was running System 5 and motif, and DEC was running BSD and DEC Windows. And what happened, right? So COSY was formed in 1992. Anyone remember what COSY stood for? Common Object Software Environment. Right? Anyone remember what CDE stood for? Common Desktop Environment. We're running out of three-letter acronyms to define what we do. So what happened was we had the, the grand, we had the grand agreement of all, which was that X window system and the Motif window manager and a desktop manager from HP. So we're done, right? How long does it take to build this thing? Well, then another couple years go by, and you get the idea. Now, OSF and OSF1 were largely a technical failure for the people who pursued it. OSF1 was the name of the competitive operating system, uh, and in, it survives in various forms. The open group um, is a long story, but AT&T sold Unix to Novell in 1993, before I was there. They also sold it before I was there. SEO bought Unix from Novell in 1995, and XOpen took over the trademark in 1995. Uh, XOpen then began to add additional you know, Unix versions. There was a Unix 98 and so forth and so on. Um, there was a version of X11R6 released in 1998, and a splinter group formed a Linux version. So you go, why would that happen? After all the things, it turns out that the terms and rules about Motif did not allow the Linux community to use it because the licensing rules about Motif were consistent with the model that the XOpen and the, the corporate world had, but not the free software, software world. What is the law you conclude from this? Sometimes no one cares. And that of all is the hardest of all of these stories to relate. Is that, that you know, your energy level and your tone and your interest level just goes down as you read this, right? Because people had moved on. Um, so then what happened was we said, okay, we got this huge problem because now all of a sudden Windows take off, so we need something called Wabi. And Wabi did not stand for Windows Application Binary Interface, according to our attorneys. <laughs> and the problem we had was that, that, as you know, the desktop is largely ruled by PCs and uh, Windows is taking off and Microsoft has done an excellent job of porting, uh, and perhaps an illegal job of porting all those things all over, and all of a sudden everyone was using Office. And Office required a set of interfaces that Windows offered that were not, in our view, standard. So we built a clone, and the clone of Windows was called Wabi. And uh, because of the licensing issues, and of course Microsoft wouldn't license us the, the necessary intellectual property to make a perfect clone, it didn't quite look right. Anybody here using Wabi today? Right. There were a few at the time, right? So we anyway we had this great intro. This is our Wabi Mania, our Wabi Mania slide, and we had a huge thing. We had all of these you know powerful speakers about how important it was that we have choices. And that by doing this and making it available, people would actually have choices on the platform. Why did Wabi not work? And it wasn't the name, by the way. Um, it was easy to keep breaking it if you're Microsoft. It was easy for yet another thing to happen. Now, I'm not suggesting that they did it deliberately. It may just be part of their normal, you know, they change things. But the fact of the matter is that, that against a fast competitor, a cloning strategy doesn't work. And it doesn't work at all. So if you want to do this, you're welcome to do it. But I've done mine, right? And I had the best team in the world. And at the time, there was a, a series of scandals involving unpublished interfaces into the internal Windows interfaces, which we had all reverse engineered. So even with all of that, it didn't work. So meanwhile, the internet is taking off. And we sort of hit another sort of interesting point here. 
Um, the, uh, this is a copy of the Internet Tidal Wave memo, which you may have seen. This is now in the public domain. It was part of the, one of the many recent lawsuits. And this is the, uh, it, it's interesting if you read it. This is, a, again, Microsoft speaking. It was written by uh, an assistant to Bill Gates. Um, the Internet is the, at the forefront of all of this, and developments in the Internet over the next several years will set the course of our industry for a long time to come. Uh, this, this memo was leaked out of Microsoft by people who wished them ill will, I guess, in the spring of 1995. And what had happened was the industry had sort of um, gotten itself into a roughly stable point. Right? We had the Windows thing going on. Finally, we'd settled all these wars. And all of a sudden, we're off to build, to build the next thing. Um, when we built that software, we began to understand that networking software was a little bit different. Um, and one, one talk that I used to give that I liked, that, where I liked some of the ideas, uh, which I resurrected, were the, entitled The Seven Deadly Sins of Networking. And these are the mistakes that people made at the time, and still, I think, make today. You always assume the network connection is up. You always assume there's no latency on the network. You assume the bandwidth is infinite. You assume the network is secure. The interconnect of the single network doesn't change. That's your assumption. There, that there's a single administration point on the network, and the network use is free. Because isn't it? And we were busy, all of us in the industry, build, busy building these, and the Internet changed the way we thought about all of this. And at the same time, Netscape was formed, and everyone, this is sort of relatively recent history, so folks in the room re re remember this. And then the Java phenomena began. The way the Java phenomena, uh, there's a lot been said about Java and the way it was originally developed, and I won't retread that here. Most of you have heard uh, myself or others talk about it. Um, uh, from, from a simple technology idea uh, to, to, to just the right timing of its use, all of a sudden we had a phenomena. So what I want to talk about is not the technology, which I, I, ha I have a lot of pride in, but how did it get s so successful given we had so many bad examples before us, which is why I took you through each of these. And by the way, there are many hours of details, all of which you'll find very boring about all of that. Um, it worked for a bunch of reasons, but one of them was this article. This was the article that was published in March of 1995. Um, I was in Aspen um, at one of these uh, technical retreats that we were doing at the time, and I remember getting the phone call that this particular reporter had managed to get in and was actually talking to the Java people, who were, of course, busy talking to them because no one had told them not to tell them. So he got so excited that he wrote an article which said that Java would take off the world. And there are two interesting things about this. The Mercury News ran this on their front page. It was read by everyone in this part of the world, and it included a quote from a rising young star, Mark Andreessen. So his endorsement, seen as the, the, the messenger of the sort of next wave of smart young people, was as important as what the article actually said. Now, it gets a, a whole bunch of things wrong because our strategy had not evolved at the time. But here's a case where, since we had gone from the, the NFS period where we had essentially no, no understanding of the press, we understood the press, and we understood how the press could be helpful. And so we used it. We didn't abuse it now. We used it, right? And we used it to, to achieve some significant gains. Um, the product itself, of course, was compelling technology. It had a clear utility. People could understand it. There was both a browser and, of course, the partnership that we did with Netscape. The um, Java made systems programmers in that sense. Um, out of ordinary applications programmers. So the initial strategy we felt with Java was that it would solve sort of three, it would solve three new, new value points. It would solve the problems that people had with C and C++. We developed an intermediate instruction set and a virtual machine which allowed for portability across platforms. And we wanted to solve the right once run anywhere problem on public networks. And uh, the strategy at the time was we need to get to ubiquity. What's the definition of ubiquity? The market share of Windows at the time was 100 million users. So I said the goal should be in five years to have 100 million users because I'd been through the previous wars and I wanted to know how to decide we were successful. Um, the licensing model worked because we had created the inevitability principle. We had created the fact that we were going to do it because since the Netscape browser was the hottest thing in the world, that meant that all of Netscape's competitors would adopt it. And then we did one deal after another. The initial deals all had a fixed licensing fee, not a per unit licensing fee, for a relatively modest fee. And of course, the deal was announced with Netscape in May, and the first Netscape browser containing Java was not actually shipped until January, and we spent all that time actually getting the thing to work. 
right? So we did this early in the product cycle. Uh, the, what's interesting is that we also were much more inclusive in how we did our, our licensing. We worked very hard to talk to people in different industries, having learned this polarization, which in hindsight was incredibly foolish, but I think we were just too young. We worked with each of the constituents, and so we wouldn't put in, for example, the JDBC interface, which is a database interface, until we had talked to all the key database companies in the community. So again, this community model was beginning to work. Now, the interesting thing about Java was it had, it had some value propositions that changed. The first one was the, uh, what we call the, the dancing duke, and many of you saw that, the demo where the, the Java ball moved up and down, and you could do that. Today, those are done by animated GIFs, right? You don't need Java for that. Um, we, the right once run anywhere became less important as the Microsoft monopoly got stronger. And of course, Netscape is no longer a factor on the browser side. That browser side. So now Java is primarily used in the mid-tier. And it turns out it's a perfect architecture for a lot of the new services on the, so on the server side. And of course, the beauty of this is that it changed the perception of the inventors. It became a, a huge marketing success. And Java is both a great language and a tremendous marketing success precisely because the, the licensing strategy that worked this time. And of course, it ended in a lawsuit, a complicated story where Sun, uh, uh, I did the contract, so I was a party, party to all of this. Sun actually ended up suing Microsoft for breach of contract and was settled. Uh, and Microsoft no longer supports Java and has now built something called C Sharp and, and CLR, which are essentially proprietary technologies with a slightly different twist with similar goals. And their technology looks pretty good, but of course, it's not at the same time. In thinking about this, I keep asking myself, did all of the shenanigans that all of us here in the valley, did they fundamentally affect the outcome of the desktop? Had we done things differently, would they have fundamentally done that? And I think the hardest conclusion that I've come to is that it probably didn't, which I find very distressing. Because I would like to be able to tell you that, that we screwed up because we spent all of these years with all of these different wars, with dupl duplication and mergers and so forth and so on. But I think in practice, our model still wouldn't have been strong enough. And, I, and I'd like to come back to that because I think that's very, very important. So, so what happened, the actual Java marketing consisted of an, an article with a picture of Mark. And of course, this was, this was at the height of this. This is an article from uh, George Kilder. And George took the strategy that we had articulated and wrote it in a way, as only George could do, where he decided that Java would take over the entire world and solve every known problem, including like cancer. Right. And what was funny about this is this SAP is only distributed to people who are Forbes subscribers. You can't buy it on the, on the newsstand. So I was in New York at a conference, and I get this phone call from Scott and other executives saying, what's this thing? Because the stock had doubled. Right. And you, you should have noticed this. And everyone was talking about this. And can I get a copy? So I took my copy, and I faxed it around. And it shows you that a well-placed argument at just the right time can have an enormous impact. And, and I look back and I look at the key points. This was a clear, a clear one of them. And of course, um, we, we got to the point where not only did, did the, the press believe this, but we believe this too. And so it became a marketing strategy for a much broader set of initiatives. And, and you can see this one. And of course, we even had even more fun with, uh, with Upside. Mom, Mom, Billy's picking on Scotty again, right? This was back in the, in the negotiations. So I'd like to, to, to take a few minutes and talk about where we are now and see if we can sort of integrate the historical look to, to where we are now. And maybe you all have some, some pretty strong opinions. A lot of you live through this with me. There are two massive fights going on right now. And, and by the way, I have a theory. And I have a theory that, that part of the reason I work in this industry and why I love it so much is that we get to run this race every few years. Right? You, too, are going to get tested again. You know, yes, Eric, you're going to have to have an opinion again on the question of how do you structure for success? How do you get these people to collaborate, uh, you know, et cetera? We have two that are, I think are, are, are very much pressing. I think the first one is web services. And uh, this is historical speech. So I won't sort of talk about it in any detail. In, in the 1990s, we focused on something, uh, something where we looked on how did business logic within an infrastructure, within a corporation get restructured. 
Um, there was something called CORBA, Common Object Request Broker Architecture, one of my more brilliant ideas. Uh, in terms of naming, um, it had objects and architectures, and it had something called an, an interface definition language, or IDL, which was a contract between interfaces. Well, CORBA has not been particularly successful. It was very he heavyweight. There's a number of people who disagree with me in the audience, so sorry about that. Um, and I think it was ultimately not very successful because it violated some of the networking principles. It was too heavyweight. It worked relatively well within intranets, but did not work across the internet for various important reasons. The Java team didn't like that for a whole bunch of reasons, so they built a Java-specific solution called RMI, which became remote, remote method invocation, which became one of the major issues with Microsoft, because they didn't like that one either, and they changed it, and they weren't allowed to, and that was part of the suit. There was this thing called COM and then DCOM, which was the Microsoft equivalent. And the problem with these technologies is that they, they were not sensitive to the networking rules. They made a set of assumptions around security and, and routability and so forth that ultimately were seen not to be correct. So in 2000, we have now embarked on a new one, and it's the world according to XML. XML stands for Extensible Markup Language. There's a, uh, a thing called uh, WSDL, Web Services Design Language. It's how you specify your objects. There's something called SOAP, which is the access protocol that actually allows you to invoke these things. There's something called UDDI, which is Universal Description, Discovery, and Integration. That's a brilliant name. Sounds like you know, something of a cow. Um, and of course, the architecture sounds great. You, know, you read the marketing architecture. If you actually look into it, it's full of problems. For example, there's no standard way to do authentication. But over the network, people care about security and authentication. And indeed, uh, a number of vendors have highly proprietary authentication mechanisms, another example of a lock-in. So you're being tested again because you've got to find the lock-in strategy. You've got to find the thing that will break this. And I'm still thinking about it. Um, UDDI, UDDI, for example, publishes something called the white pages, the yellow pages, and the green pages. Right? The white pages is about people. The yellow pages is what the company does. And green pages is access to the services that that company or organization publishes. Makes sense on paper. How do you authenticate? How do you get access? How do you name it? How do you route to it? And so forth and so on. At the same time, Microsoft has announced something called .NET and something called .NET My Services, which are their versions of this. right? And all of a sudden, we see we have another opportunity. We have a group called the Liberty Group, which is busy building a competitor. The Liberty Group is organized roughly like these other folks. Um, another example would be in Linux. This is an ad which I found profoundly humorous because it's from IBM. And if you go back and you look at the role that IBM has played in terms of licensing, and you look at the investment that they're making in Linux now, it is one of the greatest 180-degree reversals that I've seen in strategy since I've been alive. In the Linux community, give you the numbers, Linux has about 20, these are IDC numbers from last year, 27% of the server platforms are Linux, mostly running Apache, 41% are Windows or Windows related. Um, in the client, Microsoft has 91% Windows, 3.6% for the Mac, 1.4% for Linux. Right. So competition at the server side, not so much on the client side. In the Linux area, there are many people who've talked about how to solve the problems on the client side, and there's a lot of very smart people working on it. And there are too many smart people working on it, because now there's two Windows systems. One is called KDE, it's based on C++. Another one's called GNOME, based on C. It was originally developed as a replacement of Motif. There's a group called Mono, which is not exactly a brilliant name for a group, <laughs> which is a, uh, a, a, essentially a public open source organization funded, funded by a company called Zimian, Zimian uh, and a number of other companies that, that are trying to build clones of all these protocols. So perhaps what we're going is we're going from open systems to open uh, protocols or processes or something like open services. But the same dialectic, the same problems exist. And 10 years from now, someone will stand up in front of this audience, perhaps in the same room, and talk about this phenomena. And the best part of this is they have Linux International, just like we had Unix International. So I started, and I didn't bother to bring them. I read a whole bunch of articles, and the criticisms are exactly the same from literally 20 years ago. There are different licenses. There's something called the GPL. There's something called the Sun Community Source License. There's a free BSD license, which allows some limited commercial use. So, so now you go, well, OK, since you're pontificating on this, what should we actually do? OK. Well, let me posit something which makes sense to me, but I can assure you will not happen. The Linux kernel has tremendous support for it. If the Solaris and other kernel technologies were open sourced in such a way that the Linux community could get the benefit of the work that they've done, you would get a combined kernel. 
if some combination of the toolkit strategies ended up with a single API that spanned all of these systems, you could get tremendous market share, especially on the server side. And you could have majority market share on the server side. The Java could, for example, be open source. It's currently controlled by a slightly different license. And of course, why would you, why would you object to giving the Java source away? Because you know Microsoft's not going to take it anyway. That's the one thing they're not going to do. Of all the things they're going to do, they're not going to do that. And you could open source that on top of the merged machine. You could convince Apple to offer the Mac OS X, the first good user interface on top of Unix in my lifetime, right? Because remember, it's running on top of Mac. And you could put that in open source on top of the merged product. So our office, for example, from Sun is already open source. The beauty of my proposal is that you would then have best of breed at each and every protocol, application, and product layer in the industry. And that's a starting point, in my view. It's a required starting point for dealing with the strengths of the competition in this particular case. The reason this won't happen is because we've proposed in various forms these kinds of things over many years, and it doesn't happen. And it doesn't happen because of the structure of the industry and because people don't see it. Now, there's, an alternative, there's another alternative, and the other alternative is to say that, for example, the US government, which is an important procurer, will only purchase software that deals with um, data formats that are published. Right? Make sense? And that would have the property that would guarantee competitive choice at each level. What are the odds of that? It's been discussed for 10 years. Hasn't happened yet. An alternative is, in my view, to seed the desktop right, and go focus on specialized areas. And that's what most people are doing. And I think that's the, the weakest, but probably the most likely of the alternatives. So what are the new rules, really? Let me put my collection of buttons up. W what are the new rules? I'll finish up and get your comments and questions. Merge software doesn't work, right? We, we now have example after example. You can borrow technology, but you can't merge it. You have to layer it in some way. Compatibility libraries do work as long as the underlying thing is the stronger of the two. Consortia don't work at all. The people who went off to join these consortia all got absorbed into the dot-com bubble, where then, of course, they all got laid off for other reasons. Um, but none of them fundamentally had the kind of impact that they'd hoped when, when, when the marketing and the pitches really went up. They don't work. There will always be an open source choice. I was part of one. There's a wonderful one now involving Linux. And a whole generation of people, Google, for example, uh, perhaps the largest Linux cluster in the world with more than 12,000 machines and tremendous, tremendous success using Linux. Um, there will always be a Microsoft or an IBM in the role that they played 20 years ago. So the things that I'm talking about, I now have the one benefit of age, which is I have some perspective. These problems are not going away. I think there's, there's sort of two choices that you have when you think about strategy. The first is cheap volume proprietary. And I would suggest that Microsoft, eBay, Intuit, great companies following a very focused strategy, large market share, very low cost, excellent penetration, good customer relations overall. The second one is to standardize and extend through collaboration. But if you do that, you've got to start from the premise that you have the best product in the world which is hard to assemble. And then you have to execute the rest of the strategy flawlessly. You have to have full rights to implement the APIs, no fees, no hidden tricks. And you need to innovate even faster than choice A because they're the default choice. Right. And, and getting that right and maintaining that turns out to be so much harder than any of us, and certainly I, that I did. So, so every day we run this contest. And uh, I, part of, I think, what I wanted to communicate with you is that there is a younger generation of people represented in this room who are smarter, harder working, better trained than I ever was, the people that I work with. So I'm throwing this to you, right? You get to run the race again. You get to, you got the same set of problems. You got the issues around consortia, you got the issues around licensing. The stakes are even higher because what we do is so incredibly important to the world. So run the test again. And this time it's your success that's on the line and see if you can pull it off by, op by combining just the right set of laws around innovation, inev inevitability, and ubiquity, and then I think you could have a huge success. So with that, thank you very much.
So I think we wanted to do questions or comments. And I'm, I'm happy to have people debate or argue or say I'm wrong or whatever. Go ahead. Yes, sir. Hi, Eric. Yes, sir. Yes, hi. Go ahead. Uh, enjoyed your talk. Agree with it entirely. Uh, the, the issue, though, I think, is a social issue. And we tend to avoid the social issue because we're all wrapped up in things. But in order to do a technology, you have to have some ego involved in, in things. There's a massive amount of ego in all of these structures. And it's a bit like Afghanistan. You've got a bunch of co competing gangs that tear things apart. And trying to get these people to uh, collaborate in order to have the innovative muscle, they all wish or think they can do it better on their own. So that's where a lot of this dynamic comes from. How do you latch that in a, in a direction where you can team a bunch of horses together? That's been the problem running a company, but it's, an, it's kind of like you need to be the CEO of CEOs to be able to pull all of these other forces in together. And that sounds like the challenge to me, and I'm interested in w the way in which you might articulate <coughs> bringing together such people, because your idea, which I'd heard around Sun before, uh, back uh, in the uh, Sun uh, Spark Cluster days, yes. okay. It's been around there for a long time. A lot of reasons why that didn't happen in the early stages. Same reasons probably why it isn't occurring now. I'd like to see how you might propose to latch these horses together and talk to that, that particular group. Well, I, I've never worked at Microsoft, but I assume that within Microsoft they have exactly the same battles that we do among our community, but they're within the company, as opposed to in the press and across the table and with huge negotiation. Um, I don't know how to do it. I know, however, that you have an opportunity uh, with existing industry. I do think with web services and Linux, there's an opportunity to assemble just the right pieces with just the right motivation to run the race. I, I really do. Because if you look at the, the market share gains that Linux has had are, are surprisingly good, both on the server and also on the, believe it or not, Linux's market share in the client has more or less doubled in a year from like 1% to 2% but they're at least making some progress. And a lot of people want an alternative, right? Because people want choices, and they want some differentiation and so forth. Um, and I think ultimately it's a leadership test. And the problem, I, speaking as a, as a CEO of a, a public company, now a private company, there's enormous pressure on quarterly earnings. Part of the issue that, for example, Sun and IBM and HP have trouble is that they're, they're on a quarterly cycle and they have shareholders. And ultimately these are very long-term strategies. Right, many, many years. And it's hard to, they're hard to sell and hard to maintain. Yes, sir. I have a, a somewhat different point of view. I'm an end user. I'm a businessman. So I'm not an IT developer. And I think, with all due respect, that you've missed the point completely. <laughs> OK? I, I, don't, I don't mean to be negative at all. I want to give you something, OK? okay. Number one, if you are in a marketplace with a dragon who intends to dominate completely, if your strategy does not include killing the dragon, you will fail. Okay? That's very important to understand. And you have talked about several dragons over time. If you want to survive in that marketplace, you must have a dragon killing strategy within your business plan. Number two, what you want in order to succeed is my money. You want me to spend my money on your innovation, your product, and your effort. And in order for me to do that, I want to know that you're solving my problem, not yours. I want you to be a designer who takes my problem, your genius, and produces something. I don't want you to spend your time entertaining yourself and expect me to pay for it. I really want it to work for me. And I'm not being selfish about this. Uh, and, and this is the secret. This is the secret. Make it work for me. And I will give you all of the money that I can, that I make, in using your product. I will give you a very large portion of the profit that I make 
if your product works for me. So one of the things that I think we have learned about network effects is that the market share between, when I started in this industry, the rule was that uh, the first in incumbent in a competitive market had, oh, 50% market share. The second one had 35% market share. The third one had 10%, and everyone else was 5% or less. I think what we've learned in networked intellectual property markets is that those percentages are wrong. That for a variety of reasons, including vendor lock-in, customer stability, the real numbers are 90%, 9%, and 0.9%. If I follow the line of your line of reasoning, then there can only be one inhabitant. If I take that insight, which I believe is true, by the way, I actually believe that, and I take your insight and I combine the two, then there can be only one choice at each of the protocol or services layers. And I think that's where we are today. The fact of the matter is that because the competitors to Microsoft, through this, all the shenanigans that I took you through, did not ultimately build a model that was significantly better from a customer perspective. And that's hard to say because we tried. And by the way, our business plans all said we could pull it off, just to be clear. We, we're not, you know, the business plans actually claimed all that you just said. It just didn't happen. Um, then what that says is that the industry will be forever sentenced forever sentenced to having unitary choice at each of the important control points. I don't like that answer. It may be correct. And I think there's a lot of evidence to say that, that it is where we are today. Um, but I think we can do better. Um, it, a classic example is that today there's a battle over um, instant messaging. And most customers would prefer to have a single instant messaging uh, service. Uh, in this particular case, AOL is providing the, the, the majority share, and, and the other guys are, are trying to block against them. And nobody is committed to an open approach, an open process, an open, open protocol approach. And I think we would be better served by an open, interoperable solution. So here's an example where what you said I agree with in principle, but in practice it doesn't get reduced that way because the 90% rule and because of the competitive market. So, go ahead. Yes, sir. A question that's somewhat less weighty, perhaps. Um, you said early on that the Sun University Network was licensed to six or seven companies. I'm sorry, the Stanford University Network was licensed to six or seven companies, and Sun was the only one that succeeded. What, what, who were the others, and what happened? Um, I actually tried to figure that out, and I couldn't remember. Uh, they were graphics companies, and the idea was that they would be embedded in graphics, what were then thought of as graphics workstations. This was back before the, remember, this is roughly when the PC had just happened, PC didn't have an integrated graphics frame buffer, so its graphics were terrible. And so these people were off building specialized graphics computers, and none of them made it. Thank you. Vaughn, I think you did the deals. <laughs> this is the problem with an audience like this. People actually know the answer. Thank you. <laughs> Vaughn, what was, the, what was the list again? Forward, uh, Fortune, um, of course. Okay. okay, we got it. Good. That's a, that's a that's a network effect of ever saw. Yes, sir. Um, I. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Yes, um, sir. actually, Eric. Um, actually, thank you for the talk. I actually work for Sun. I'm actually an IT technologist myself, and I have a different perspective. Um, today, I see actually two battles going on. You are correct. One of them be surrounding common services. The other one surrounding web services. And there's no real differences between the two of them. You are correct that there is no registration authentication um, standard. There's no way to actually um, port or do the protocols. But then I, g I hear both sides of the story, it's really hard to architect something that makes the business happy. Yeah, we'd love to take your money and make something out of it. But how would you go about in changing what I call more like social issues, such as you may create the greatest application, say Star Office for that matter. But Star Office is like um, word perfect, clunky, and slow. So how do you create something so that you can accept, have the user community accept it without having the backlash? I think that the bar for new products and new vendors continues to be higher. 
right? That what happens at each and every level, it gets harder to overcome whatever level of satisfaction that they have. If you go back 20 years ago, there wasn't a personal computer. 20 years ago, there wasn't a, a workstation industry. People were on mini computers. And so the barrier to entry was relatively low. When people would enter it, they could try things and so forth. The barrier to entry right now for desktop computing and servers is extremely high in what we think of as client-server computing. I think in web services, you can see that because there are actually very few web services in use. If you go to the UDDI directories that, that exist there, there's very little. The only one that anyone talks about is Passport, and it's down half the time because they have to turn it off because of security architecture problems. They're, they're busy working on it. So I think that the problem here is, once again, we got too good at talking to the press and talking about the marketing of our products, and the products themselves are either not shipping, not integrated, not... Now, the fact that I had to re repeat to you what SOAP was indicates a failure of marketing. Right? Because if you have to understand what, what the ob access protocol to talk to the objects is, are, are, then this is not an object you're going to be consuming anytime soon. Right? This is like discussing the details of spark gaps in your, in your, in your car. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, Eric, thanks very much for your speech. And uh, I realize you've run this race before. But uh, if you have to wake up now, let us suppose you, you, you have to run the race now again. What will your focus be? Well, I'm actually at Google. <laughs> so I, I, so I, I woke up and, and went someplace else. <laughs> um, <laughs> And, 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 and Google is a pure example. I don't, I don't want to turn this into a Google pitch because I don't think that's appropriate. Google is a pure example of a new model. It's a brand new product. It's architected very differently. It doesn't carry over the strategic problems that I highlighted. Whatever strategic problems we have will be the subject of a subsequent talk by, <laughs> by, by folks here in this audience 20 years from now. Uh, because we'll fight, we'll fight, we'll, we will also fight battles with respect to standardization and access, but they will be at the services layer not at the platform layer. And I can tell you that the, um, so in other words, there was, there's a book called Computer Wars, which was a documentation of the IBM battles around establishing the mainframe interfaces that brought IBM to dominance in 1968 to 1972. I wasn't part of those, so I didn't talk about them. The battles and strategies are identical to what I described. And the reason IBM was so successful during that period of time is through a series of tactics which were ultimately found largely illegal through various unbundling, and you can go through all the details there. They got all the applications vendors to favor them and to get off of everyone else, and they used software rental and hardware rental in various clever ways to do it. So controlling an application and controlling a platform turns out to be the maximum control point. One way to think about the value of Microsoft, which is a $100 plus billion dollar corporation, or the value of Apple, which is much less than that, is that what you're really seeing is you're seeing a value of the architectural franchise that they have built. Because it is that architectural franchise that allows them to move the ball forward. And that's what we do. And now, so for example, the Linux community is trying to establish an architectural franchise, and it's their turn to do that. Right? Yes, sir. You spoke briefly on the role of government and why things do or don't happen within the government itself. And again, being somewhat older than you, hopefully I have a perspective. I can think of several things that happened over the last 25 years, of which the IBM you mentioned was one, yeah. that through government action or inaction, literally forced the issue of adoption of what ultimately became the broader platform, if you will. I think the most obvious one that I saw in the industry in which I was in, which different from most of the people here, it was all aerospace and defense, was when the uh, IBM architecture, Microsoft et al., became the platform of choice in the late 80s, as opposed to, uh, say, uh, an excellent system from DEC and also some excellent systems from uh, Apple at that time, which many, many people were using. The government literally made the argument, as did a number of large businesses, our big iron is big blue. Therefore, our desktop should be big blue. And we had a war in my company because we were using lots of decks tied to craze, and we wanted deck desktops. But the company ultimately listened to the insurance and contract people and went with the IBM Microsoft architecture. So did the government. I, I think that 
it depends on the scale and, si and place you are in a technology strategy, but it's actually useful to have smart customers. Um, and most of the initiatives that began successfully started with highly knowledgeable customers who, who had a specific need that was not served in the market. So any strategy going forward has to solve a new problem. Let, let me give you an example. If you, if you take my little scenario, which is Star Office and the Mac and the X desktop and the mer merger of Linux on a desktop, how many of you would switch to it because it was more useful as I described it? Right? You'd switch to it because it had the Mac user interface, something which you're familiar with. But I haven't described something that was a, a different experience completely. I haven't given a really compelling pitch yet. So it would have to be something more than that. It'd have to be better integration, some service that you can't do. And so I, I think that at, at each stage in our industry, there is an incumbent and there's a challenger. And your story is a good one, because th these wars were practiced since, I think, the founding of computing, because the economics worked. The difference now is because they're in software, the market share games are much faster. Uh, as an aside, we used to have a, a during the bubble, which I was proud to, to participate in, but didn't sell at the top, unfortunately. Uh, we, uh, we had this sort of clock, and the idea was that you would call up a press person and you would announce that there's going to be uh, a new website. And uh, you would get them to write an article about this new website, and that as a result of this article, there would be a million visitors to that website. Then you'd call up the press person and you'd say, well, there were a million users to the website, so they'd write that article, right? <laughs> so then you'd get 10 million user visitors to the red website, and then, of course, you get the article about the next site, and then you're kaput. So the thing that's different now is the ability to pulse society. There's a lot of theories about this, but the access to information broadly allows you to play these games more quickly. And that's why I think there'll be another bubble around technology. There'll be another, spec you know, not just financial, but also technology speculative one. And I think all of us will be alive and, and able to participate in it and, and say, again, 15 years from now, yeah, this is like the one we saw last time. David. Um, Eric, this has been uh, uh, fascinating to me because I watched this whole thing from a different position. As you know, I, uh, at Intel, as part of the Wintel uh, combination, from, uh, running the microprocessor business from 78 to 91, I watched all of this happen. And, and you might think that, that we would have been a sort of anti this, but on the other hand, we were very pro Unix simply because we were tied uh, with Microsoft and fighting for power. And should Unix be successful, then Microsoft's power would be weaker and ours relative would have been stronger. So we were, we were aligned with this, with this activity. But I've got a little different perspective on what happened um, uh, during this and therefore impacts what your recommendation is. And what I observed is with Microsoft, you did have the CEO of CEOs. There's one person that could make decisions. Unix really got started. The thing that made it take off was BSD and these free cop or nearly free copies. And it was like shareware, and it was very Linux-like at that point in time. And that works very well for software people. And people are generating code. But it's not a business. And the problems all happen because these became businesses, and each force, every group of engineers, reported to a separate set of shareholders. And each set of shareholders wanted primarily their net worth to increase, therefore the quarterly reports and the financial requirements and, and as that you had mentioned before. The possibility of getting these multiple forces all to align on a single direction, that is to have a single direction in their own best economic interest, is almost impossible because of the number of combinations. And it seems to me that any of these programs or, or, or initiatives that require the longer term, more than a few, you know, one day for a press conference would be longer term, but a longer term cooperation between multiple sets of shareholders is inherently flawed and won't work. And I'd like your comment on that. Well, that's, I think, a, a, an accurate description of where we are now. Um, I'd like everyone to remember, remember all the deals that Apple did with IBM? 
Right? Remember all the special companies that they built and so forth? I think like maybe you were part of one of those. When the bo your boss called up and said, yeah, you're working over there for a while. Um, we've tried to solve this problem. We've tried joint ownership. We've tried joint ventures. Um, we have not solved this problem. I, and, and I agree. I think it's the core problem. It's a governance problem. Uh, uh, you said, I think, uh, earlier that it was an ego problem. I, I think it is an ego problem, and I think we had it. Uh, but I also think it's really a governance problem. If we organize it differently, I think the, the right answer for this is to look at the models that have worked. If you look at the ITF, many of you have participated in that. That's a model that worked very well. It brought us the internet, right? People like Vince and other heroes of mine, you know, who, who operated selflessly and really did it. And I think there's a category of things for which that will work. But 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 it, but it worked. But it worked for 15 years, and 15 years is a long time. If you told me that for the next 15 years we have a, a, a vent type person and an IETF type structure that's going to work on services that are going to be truly interoperable and extensible, I'd sign up at a heartbeat. Because that model works. Right? And it's one of the few that I can point at that's been highly successful for us. And again, it brought us the internet and, and brought us all the successes we've seen today. Yes, sir. Um, th this is actually, it was right along the same uh, comment, but a, a, slightly, a slightly different point. See, that. Uh, the governance problem, that if only you could get these folks to work together, in other words, if you just got them to all uh, see that um, uh, their personal long-term benefit is by working as a team, that actually there's another problem that may make it even harder, and that's really a technical and a business problem. Okay, first of all, technically it's always hard to get different groups to work together. Okay, and you always need some czar that makes a decision that is suboptimal in some fashion, but any decision is better than no decision, okay, and that there are real technical problems there. And, but the other thing is that also, I mean, what, if you're fighting a dragon, what Microsoft does is it takes serious losses on one side, okay, to make sure that it captures that, okay. And whenever you have different businesses, I mean, unless you could come up with some strategy, and I can't see how you can come up with some strategy, where you can take a big loss in one company because it's going to help the other company, okay, and you're going to help the stack. And I don't, you know, it's sort of an argument that says that won't work, you know, no matter how good the intentions people are. Let me give you another example that I think has worked well. Um, it, the structure of the Internet, and, I, and this was not an Internet talk, and as you probably know, I spent the last five years talking about the Internet. So it's kind of a different from what I normally talk about. The Internet is organized in a way that I think gives us hope. Because none of the existing players, the long-haul carriers, the ISPs, people like UUNet, who at various times had large market shares, ch either chose to or were able to turn them into dominant monopolistic structures. There's a couple reasons for that. The Internet itself and the routing architecture made it hard. The business economics did not promote it. The, um, the community was more collegial. Right, as a group, speaking as a member, I can tell you it's more collegial, that group rather than the other. Uh, and I think we've benefited from it. So, for example, when the leaders of Cisco and, of course, Dave, Dave played an important role in this, when they w would all get together, they were actually nice to each other. They actually collaborated on extension. I mean, this is actually important. Um, I mean, as a note, you know, President Bush and President Putin met at, at Crawford Ranch. This is actually important in the things. It helps avoid war, which is a good thing to avoid. Um, and so I think that there is a model in networking, and it's unfortunate that in the platform economic world, that model is not followed. A okay. couple more questions. On, I want to be sensitive to time. Go ahead. Yes, sir. In your talk, you mentioned some of your big disappointments over the last 20 or 30 years of computer history, and uh, maybe these are side effects of what you're talking about, but one of the things that I've seen as a big disappointment is that the, the best technology always loses. Um, and... Uh, uh, and in fact, it's it's worse than that because it keeps getting reinvented and losing again. Um, <laughs> you know, how many times are we going to reinvent virtual memory? How many times are we going to reinvent ACLs? How many times are yeah. we going to reinvent? You know, just just a few examples like that. Can you touch on 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 that topic? I mean, it's just it's it's very disappointing well, to me. Well, and I know this is a very broadly held view. Can I can I again just disagree with you on one thing? The best technology as defined by the customer wins. And it turns out that sometimes their perception of what technology matters and what the aspects that matter turn out to be very different from what we as technologists think matter. 
turns out in the PC industry, the single most important thing was an interoperable hardware platform that was, had declining cost economics, right? And it turned out that that was more important than the elegance and simplicity of the Mac user interface, which is, at the time, was an extraordinary gap. It had to, and there are a lot, that's a much longer conversation. But one of the things I've learned is that the customer, and going back to this earlier gentleman who, who disagreed with, with my point of view, in this particular case, we agree, that the customer ultimately does speak with, and, and they eventually win, and any strategy that involves sort of continually disappointing them is a problem. Part of the reason that why the Microsoft and Intel alliance with all their partnerships ultimately e evolved is they solved the customer problem that the customer had at the time. If you go back to news, which is a technologically brilliant product, it didn't solve the problem that the customer had and so that technology, which was clearly inferior, X, has become the dominant standard. And we all love X now. Also, the people who built, well, maybe, maybe, maybe not everyone. It turns out that in the news case, the most interesting thing about news was that the people who did that were the Java team 10 years later. So sometimes you have to reinvent it in a different context. Java, which again is, is a crowning achievement for all, all concerned, and I think a great, a, a wonderful thing, it solved a lot of problems, was the right sim, uh, integration of a whole bunch of technologies which had been around for a long time. Uh, I can tell you, by the way, we're not going to be reinventing ACLs for a long time because there's two dominant operating systems, Windows and, and Linux, and they both already have them in various forms. So again, it may be that we're now going to go reinvent everything one level higher. A classic example is instant messaging. Another one is in uh, Codex, the various uh, uh, data, um, video interchange formats. There's, it's like, why do I need another one? Right? Wasn't that one good enough? Right? We keep inventing them and inventing them. And that seems to be a, stru a structural problem, I think. A couple more. Yes, sir. Let's try to do it quickly. Yes. Yes, ma'am, excuse me. All right, so you kept talking about the customer this and the customer that, and you mentioned highly knowledgeable customers, but most of the customers out there aren't highly knowledgeable, and they're not driven by facts and technology, they're driven by emotions. The whole Brutus versus Mark Antony thing. Brutus went first, he appealed to logic and reason, and then Mark Antony went and stirred everybody up and they ran over Brutus. Um, um, the whole the Java article that was written about why Java will solve everyone's current problems, that's what got Sun's stock to double. That's what got everyone really interested. It's all social, social issues and communication. I was at Hackers Conference a month ago, and uh, Matt Blaze was talking about how like, criticism is not allowed anymore because of the DMCA, and there's all these social problems. And if we can decide what, the techno what we want the technology to do, then we can do it. It's just defining the problem. We can do it. It's getting it out to the people because all the 100 million users that use Windows, those are the normal people, the secretaries. <laughs> and no, seriously, those are the majority of the country. We like to think that they don't exist here in the Valley, but they do, and they're the ones that buy everything. Um, and so I think we need to start um, figuring out what the normal old problems are that people care about because when you solve big things to solve new problems, and you have to educate the people as to what the new problem it's solving. That's a yeah. whole big problem. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, pretty much, how do you... In my, my experience with, with the average person, um, which consists of my mother, um, is that they struggle with the complexity of what we build. And I think that uh, as proud as we are of all of us for what we've done in, in terms of the technology, and I took you through my variant of our history, you know, my sort of 25 years of history, our products are hard to use, hard to install, hard to administer for normal people. My father's uh, a doctor, and he has an MD, and he has to call me up and ask me, how do I do this in Windows? Well, thank goodness he has you. <laughs> um, a couple more quick, quickly. Okay, all set? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Eric, what a good, Eric, we have one, one oh very small token of appreciation. Oh, wonderful. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you okay, so thank much. you very much. Great job. Okay, take care. Thank you. I think Eric will be around for a few more minutes. Uh, there's a reception out in the back. There's some uh, refreshments. And hope you enjoy yourself. And please keep us in mind at the end of the calendar year. Thank you very much.